Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. A new survey shows that there is a strong development pipeline for renewables in South Africa, with significant implications for grid planning and investment. Terence Kumer joins me to discuss the results. Hi Terence. Hi Shana. Why did ESCOM and two renewables industry bodies undertake the, the survey? Well, you know the grid is becoming a major constraint to the connection of new renewable energy and to South Africa's transition from coal to renewables. We need to have much more grid capacity in different areas to where it's been in the past. Generally, we've had uh, electrons flowing from the northeast of the country and then flowing in through Gauteng to the south and to the west. And that flow is going to change direction over the next couple of decades as we start building more renewable utility scale renewable energy in areas of the best acreage, renewables acreage for wind uh, it's the, the Cape provinces, the eastern, the western and the northern Cape provinces are, are very potent wind uh, jurisdictions and then obviously we know that northern Cape is almost unsurpassed internationally with regard to solar radiation so it's uh, important that we start building uh, this grid but at the moment it's a constraint so the survey was done by Eskim as you say Sapvia, Sawia, those are the, wind, uh, the, the solar and the, the wind bodies respectively and canvassed their members and others to understand what is the development pipeline and where is it so that uh, to sort of influence grid planning and uh, as you would expect a lot of it is in those provinces that I mentioned but it was very interesting to see a, a, a really large pipeline uh, and basically people really having some energy around getting uh, renewables into the grid as well as uh, some battery storage and gas what does the survey show and what does it mean for the grid? Well, it shows that there's a pipeline, a development pipeline of about 66 gigawatts. That's a lot of uh, uh, renewable electricity. Two gigawatts of that is gas to power. Uh, it's mixed between solar and wind. And it shows, too, that quite a lot of this is co-located uh, with battery energy storage. It was quite interesting to see. So a lot of the solar capacity is couple to battery energy storage and some of the wind as well and some of the battery storage as well that's been planned is being planned independently so it shows that there's a lot of interest uh, private sector this is all private sector is looking to build and uh, is is uh, what is also interesting is about 18 gigawatts of that is at a very very advanced stage so the way that's defined is does it have a power purchase agreement say if it's a bilateral agreement between private entities, uh, RPP and say a mine, um, and does it have, or does it, is it bid ready in the sense as if there was a, a round open from a procurement perspective from the, from the RPP office, would it be ready to bid? So has it got its environmental authorizations, its grid connective uh, agreements, and could it sort of connect uh, into the grid within sort of three years if it had grid connectivity either from Eskom or municipality and it showed about 20 gigawatts of projects in that pipeline sort of ready either bid ready or with a PPA and with the environmental approval so uh, that was I think an eye opener um, it, it sort of confirms what the president has been saying around the, uh, the nature of the reform that's taken place um, that's allowed projects of any size it used to be limited to one megawatt then 100 megawatts uh, to proceed uh, without a license. So this was a major reform that entered the system and the, the president talks about a pipeline of about 10 gigawatts that around the embedded generation reform. Obviously this is, uh, uh, the survey takes into account projects that won't necessarily uh, proceed through that dispensation but might be bidding into a national program like our REAP program. That, it, well, that was the only game in town uh, between say 2011 and two years ago. Now we've got a, a multi-off-take market emerging. And I think this, this whole coupling and using the grid more effectively, so that's, we're also seeing that, I think. So using a connection point, co-locating wind and solar, because they generally have different uh, sort of production profiles. Uh, wind generally uh, over the evening uh, picks up. And obviously we know the bulge in the midday uh, for solar. So co-locating at connection points has, has become a, a sort of a trend or a theme. And uh, then the other theme, I think, that for planning that's coming through 
is that uh, or, or battery storage needs to also be co-located. That helps relieve capacity on a constrained grid. So that's a big part of it. And then also the other thing is to start planning for some sort of level of curtailment, um, which is basically, unfortunately, wasting some of that energy. But it, but if you p don't plan for any curtailment, the cost of that is actually is quite a, a lot because you, s you sort of restrict what grid capacity you do have, uh, limited grid capacity, and it's a precious resource at the moment. You restrict it almost artificially. Whereas if you allow for some curtailment, some wasted energy, it means that you unlock a lot more capacity in a very constrained environment. So I think those are some of the key themes that are emerging. But this is all about a tool for planning so that the system operator, the grid planners, can use this information to say where can we add maybe some battery storage immediately to unlock it because there's a lot of pent up demand for grid capacity and that's an immediate thing that you can do and we know that the IPP office is in the process of procuring and Eskom's putting in their own uh, batteries so that that's important and then also in terms of spatial planning for the next uh, the, the rollout of the grid more broadly so where the power lines will be uh, where those main corridors will be what voltage they'll be and also where the substations will be. Is ESCOM up to the task of addressing these grid constraints? Well, I think it's been very difficult for the, the transmission side of ESCOM to sort of uh, to punch its full weight over the last few years. You know, the whole focus has been um, around the generation business. One, initially because when we realized we were short belatedly in the around 2006, 2007, you know, we, we went ahead with these mega projects, Madupi, Kusile, and Ngula, that sucked in a lot of resource, time, and a lot of money. Um, and then as we progressed through our energy crisis and the generation business has been performing so poorly, obviously that gets the most attention. And even though every year the transmission business puts out its transmission development plan and it shows how much grid capacity needs to be built, we haven't really seen that, you know, being built at, at the pace and scale that we need for, for connecting new generation and for the energy transition. So that change in flow that I was talking about earlier. And uh, I think now that uh, people are understanding that this is a key constraint, if not the main constraint to getting uh, renewables connected to the grid, there's a lot more attention. Plus we're having a restructuring of Eskom where the transmission business is being unbundled, uh, vertically separated really, because it's going to still remain under Eskom Holdings. And it's really the heart of Eskom, of the future of Eskom. There's going to be an independent board. Uh, there's more money that's going towards this business. There's, there's more effort going into trying to meet the transmission development plan targets uh, and the rollout targets. And, and um, Eskom had an important meeting with its suppliers last week where it said, its default model in this business is going to be an EPC model, which is a departure from the past. And that's really all about speeding up um, uh, the, the, the deployment. So at the moment, they're doing around 400 kilometers a year. They need to be doing at least 1,500 kilometers a year. And they're hoping that this sh shift in procurement from the old system to the new system will assist to that. They will do some old procurement, old style but this will be the, the sort of standard operating procedure and it should accelerate things and, it, and there is more money available. And then I think in parallel, there is thought going into sort of a public-private partnership model as well for grid deployment. And I think that's important uh, to put some competitive pressure on Eskom itself, even though Eskom will be the counterparty, but to really start really scaling up the grid investment in South Africa, I think we might need other investors other money and other skills coming in and uh, what, as I say put a bit of competitive pressure on the transmission business in Eskom to show what can be done in terms of building lines really quickly. It is a difficult game you know it's about you need servitudes, you need access to land, there's this whole issue of you know that, that things, the servitude um, acquisition takes very very long and I think Eskom now also says they've, they've got a test case where they've, they've been able to get through and um, you know to, to k get access to land that they weren't able to access through South Africa's existing legislation. So they have a test case in Limpopo, and they really think servi servitude acquisition um, and taking land that they need for grid, there's now a way to do that. So I think all in all, 
slowly the ducks are getting into the row. We're very late in the day on this. It's a very big gap that we have to fill. But there are signs um, as we, uh, that, we, that things are making, that the right thinking is in place, that some of the right projects and the planning is in place. And I think this deeper collaboration with the industry is also important because they're getting a feel for the pulse of where people want to put projects. So I think that's also important. So I think overall, while, it's, uh, while we're coming from a deep backlog, we're starting to see signs that we can start tackling it at last. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.